This conference will now be recorded. So the typical scenario here is that the patient is not able to see and the physician is also not able to see. So can anyone tell me what we have missed in the examination here? Okay, so... So pupil examination, exactly. So what we have missed here is the examination of the pupil because a simple pupil examination would have just uh, led us to the diagnosis that there was some problem in the optic nerve because we know that out of the various examination or uh, various evaluation of the optic nerve function, pupil is one of the most important one. So pupil evaluation was missed in this patient and because of that we are not, we will, if the if the, we have already subjected the patient to dilatation with mydriatics, we will not be able to examine the pupil and then we'll have to delay the diagnosis until further evaluation of the pupil. So for every patient that comes to us, just a simple torchlight examination by the uh, of the pupil is mandatory. So another case scenario, a patient who is just uh, around 30 years old female, she comes to you with just mild pain, in, uh, mild pain and heaviness in the eye all the examination including the visual acuity is normal again this is the same condition uh, sometimes early cases of optic neuritis where the visual acuity may still be normal can be detected early enough if we do a pupil evaluation so out of the various optic nerve functions pupil evaluation is the easiest one and which is very convenient also so our topic for with this background will come to our topic for today that is the importance of pupil evaluation so in this topic, today we'll be learning about um, normal pupil, how a normal pupil looks like, uh, and what are the different things that we have to look for in a normal pupil evaluation. Then we'll talk about the brief, uh, briefly about the pupillary pathway. We'll talk about the different types of abnormal pupillary reaction. And then we'll finally conclude with the diagnostic approach to pupillary abnormalities. So what is pupil? As we all know, pupil is the aperture in the center of the iris that regulates the amount of light that enters inside the eye. So this pupillary aperture is forever changing. It is never constant. And uh, there are various types of stimuli that trigger the change in the size of the pupil, out of which the most common one is the light impulse. So as we know that when there is uh, bright light, the pupil constricts, making the size of the aperture smaller. And thereby, it not only regulates the size, it also helps to regulate our visual acuity. Because we know that if there is very bright light and a lot of light is entering inside the eye, there will be a lot of spherical aberrations and uh, uh, chromatic aberrations when the light from the peripheral part of the cornea and the peripheral part of the light, light enters. Similarly, when there is dim light condition or when the condition of the room is scotopic then the pupil dilates and by dilating it increases the amount of light that enters inside the eye which helps to stimulate the rods and in turn which helps to give a better visual acuity so by regulating the size of the pupil we are able to regulate the image that is formed in the retina so this change in the size of the pupil is basically done by two types of muscles that are present in the iris so there is one sphincter muscle which is present uh, circularly around the pupillary margin. So these muscles, when they constrict, they help in decreasing the size of the pupil. So these constrictor muscles, they are under the influence of the parasympathetic nervous system. So that means when there is uh, increase in the parasympathetic impulses in the body, it will cause myosis. Similarly, there is another muscle which helps, uh, which is arranged radially from the root of the iris to the uh, margins of the pupil. So this muscle, because it is radially, in a, uh, radially arranged, when it constricts, it causes dilatation of the pupil. And that is dilatation of the pupil is also known as mydriasis. And this muscle is under the influence of the sympathetic nervous system. So if there is any problem in the sympathetic nervous system, it's not able to dilate. Then the, in, under that con, uh, under that circumstances, the pupil will become small. So there is a constant play of the different types of nervous system in the body, which help to change the size of the pupil. So de depending upon the ambient light, depending upon the influence of the sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous system, the pupil is forever changing. But there is one occasion in which 
even under the same kind of situation that is there is no change in the underlying uh, influence of the nervous system and there is no change in the intensity of the illumination of uh, illumination of light then also sometimes the pupil is constantly changing and this condition is known as the pupillary unrest or hippus the exact cause of this phenomenon is still unknown but this is normally reg regarded as a normal physiological condition and sometimes in some patients this pupillary unrest also known as pupillary oscillations are very subtle but in some cases it might be quite prominent and unless they are very prominent uh, they usually do not cause any other significant problems and they do not need to be evaluated further so when we look at the pupil why is examination of the pupil exactly important because pupil examination is quick and non invasive technique and it not only tells us about the health of the eyes it also gives us an idea about the nervous system so it is a very important part of the neurological assessment in all the patients who undergo neurological evaluation a pupil is integral part and all the neurologists also they need to know about this topic so when we know about the change in size the equality of the pupil the reactivity of the pupil sometimes we are able to understand the underlying um, uh, vital information about the underlying health of the central nervous system as well so um, as a clinician as a eye care provider examination of the pupils uh, may help us to identify different pathologies not only of the eye but also sometimes help us to diagnose some life threatening conditions like tumors or aneurysms so hopefully after today's class we'll get an idea about how to examine the pupil and how to interpret the findings so that we are able to pick up serious conditions neurological conditions also and by proper evaluation we are able to uh, exclude unnecessary or expensive tests in cases of benign condition so let's start off with the uh, i you know, how a normal pupil is evaluated so when we examine a normal pupil we often use, i use the acronym perla so what does perla stand stand for perla means pupils which are equal round and reactive to light and accommodation so this almost um, it uh, it gives us an idea about a lot of things about the pupil it tells us whether the pupils are equal it tells us about the shape of the pupil it tells us about the reaction of the pupil to light and accommodation but there are few things that is still missed in this uh, perla acronym so what we miss is the exact size of the pupil the exact size of the pupil whether it's 2 mm whether it's 5 mm that is not mentioned here then what is uh, what other thing is uh, important thing is missing is the swinging flashlight test so swinging flashlight tells a uh, test tells us about the relative afferent pupillary defect so though although we can use perla these two things that we have to uh, Um, add to our examination is the size of the pupil, whether the reaction is brisk, or whether it is sluggish, and whether there is a RAPD. If you add these three, it becomes more comprehensive for evaluation of the pupil. So normally, when we are uh, um, when we describe our pupil, we say it is round. There are some conditions when the pupil may not be round, and we'll be discussing about that also uh, in a few, in a short while. Then it is regular. Both the pupils are equal. and when we talk about the size of the pupil the normal range is about 2 to 5 mm so when we describe a pupil we usually describe it in a term in terms of a range because the pupil is forever changing or we can also describe it depending upon the illumination of the room for example in scotopic condition we can say that it is 5 mm and in photopic condition it can be 2 mm so we can also describe it uh, depending upon the ambient room temperature Uh, ambient room illumination then there are other factors which helps to change the size so one of the factors is the age of the patient in the extremes of the age that is in the newborns and in the old age the pupils are usually small in the adolescent and young adults the pupils are larger and uh, and this is because in the infants and in the newborns the dilator muscles are not very well developed because of which the pupils are small then as we age the, during the adolescence and when we are young adults there is an overactivity of the sympathetic nervous system in the body and because of this systemic uh, sympathetic overaction in the body the pupils also tends to be larger then as we old as we age there is an uh, the <clears throat> parasympathetic activity overtakes the uh, overtakes 
um, the parasympathetic activity and then as we age and as we reach the middle age then again the pupil starts to become smaller and finally in old age it becomes quite small and it's difficult to dilate especially in diabetic patients and this is because of the fibrosis of the sphincters so one thing that helps to change the size of the pupil is the age there are some other factors also that um, uh, affect the size of the pupil and the other factor is the sleep when we sleep there is a parasympathetic predominance in our uh, physiology because of which the, uh, there is uh, overaction of the constrictor muscles leading to a smaller pupil or a myosin pupil when we are sleeping similarly uh, a refractive status also um, uh, seems to alter our size of the pupil because hyperopes have been noted to have smaller pupils the other factor that uh, did, uh, determines our size of the pupil is the color of the iris also because dark iris people with dark iris they tend to have smaller pupils uh, and another thing to note is that premature baby usually they do not have who are born before 31st week of gestation do not have pupillary light reactions so uh, we should not be alarmed if we do not see any pupillary light reactions in premature babies who are born before 31st week of gestation so when we describe about the size of the pupil when the size of the pupil are equal in both eyes the condition is known as isochoria but when the one of the pupils is smaller or larger than the other one or in other words the pupils are unequal the condition is known as anisochoria myosis is the state of the pupils in which the pupils are constricted abnormally and mydriasis is the stage in which the pupils are dilated so a dilated pupil is called a mydriasis uh, the state of um, constricted pupil is known as myosis when the pupils are unequal in size it is known as anisochoria and when both the pupils are equal in size it is known as isochoria now coming to the shape of the pupil the shape of the pupil as we know is uh, round and it is central but sometimes the pupil may be uh, may not be central in <coughs> location a uh, non central location of the pupil is known as correctopia now coming to the shape a shape of the pupil is usually round as we just said sometimes it might be uh, other than round so in the first figure in the uh, uh, top left side we can see that the pupil is keyhole shaped because there is an absence of the iris tissue at the 6 o'clock position and this is typically associated with the coloboma of the iris which is usually because of the uh, a non closure of the uh, in, inferior um, inferior crest during the development the middle picture on the uh, on the top it shows that there is a big iridodialysis so iridodialysis which uh, means that there is a disinsertion of the iris from its root leading to the overhanging of the iris below leading to a distorted pupil size and also a double pupil so in the picture towards the right uh, top right we can see that there is a um, inflamed eye there is a circumciliary congestion the cornea is slightly hazy and the pupil is medilated and it is fixed uh, and for the evaluation which is, uh, which is not quite uh, obvious in this picture we, we will be able to see that the ac uh, angle uh, anterior chamber is quite shallow so this is a case of angle closure glaucoma so it's usually associated with the vertically oval mid dilated and fixed pupil and there are areas of iris sphincter uh, iris atrophies and when we measure the when we palpate the globe it is usually hard so this is a case of angle closure glaucoma with a vertically oval and fixed mid dilated pupil then in the bottom left of the picture we can see that there is a peaked pupil and because of a limbal perforation uh, the iris tissue has uh, prolapsed out from the wound uh, which is covered by the conjunctiva leading to the peaked appearance of the pupil in a open globe injury and the last picture on the bottom uh, right it shows that there is a flower shaped pupil because of the multiple posterior synechia and these synechia are usually associated with inflammation in the anterior segment usually in anterior uveitis and sometimes also can be seen in trauma cases so this is about the abnormal shape of the pupil now we'll talk about the color of the pupil so when we uh, the iris uh, they have got um, 
various colors due to the number of the melanosomes that are present there. And behind the iris, the color of the lens and the color of the media will determine the color of the pupil. So normally the color is uh, black in color, but sometimes there can be presence of a jet black pupil, especially in cases of aphakia, when there is no lens, when there is uh, nothing behind the um, pupillary aperture, it looks like a tunnel and it gives the appearance of a jet black pupil. A grayish white pupil is associated uh, with a mature cataract. Uh, similarly, a whitish pup uh, pupil or a white pupillary reflex is uh, typically seen in retinoblastoma in children. And there might be a list of differential diagnoses which, which, uh, which in itself will require a separate class. Then a yellowish pupillary uh, pupil is usually associated with endophthalmitis or resolving vitreous hemorrhage, which, give, which, gives, uh, which is present, uh, which is uh, given by the yellowish greenish exudates or um, resolving vitreous hemorrhage, which gives a yellowish appearance behind the uh, lens. So this was about the color of the lens. So the color of the, sorry, color of the pupil. The color of the pupil will also give us an idea about the different pathologies. But for today's class, we'll be concentrating on the neuroophthalmic point of view from uh, for the pupil examination. So now we are coming to an important part of the uh, pupillary examination. We'll be talking about the pupillary reflexes. So when we talk about a pupillary reflex, we describe it as whether the pupillary reflex is brisk or whether it is sluggish. A normal pupillary reflex in a healthy uh, person will be brisk. And as we know, when the light enters, uh, light is uh, given to a, uh, is uh, shown on a eye, the reaction of the eye uh, pupil will be to constrict. And in this, uh, in this animation, we can see that the light is being shown to the left eye. The pupil of the left eye is constricting. But at the same time, we notice that the pupil in the right eye is also constricting. So when the pupil in the left eye is constricting, because of the real, uh, light shining in the left eye, this is known as the direct pupillary reflex. And when the pupil in the right eye is constricting, when we are shining a light to the uh, left eye, it is known as the consensual pupillary reflex. So this is quite interesting. But why does it happen? To understand why this is occurring, we'll have to once uh, we'll have to study. Uh, we'll have to know a little bit about the anatomy of the pupillary pathway. So let's go to the anatomy of the pupillary pathway. So coming to the pathway of the pupillary light reflex, we know that when the light stimulus or the light impulse falls on the rods and cones of the retina. The axons of the ganglion cells, which traverse by the optic nerve, take the impulse to the central nervous system. So the impulses are transmitted by the optic nerve to the optic chiasma. In the optic chiasma, the pupillary motor fibers of the nasal side, they cross towards the opposite side. The fibers are further tra travel by the optic tract. And from the optic tract, they go to the pretectal nucleus. From the pretectal nucleus, the internuncial fibers, they traverse to the edinger westphal nucleus of the both sides. That is, from the pretectal nucleus, there is bilateral innervation of the edinger westphal nucleus. And from the edinger westphal nucleus, the fibers, they go to the by the third cranial nerve, where they synapse at the ciliary ganglion. And they try and uh, and these uh, from the synapse the short cili ciliary nerves they innervate the sphincter pupillae and cause the meiosis or the constriction of the pupil so for the uh, this is the parasympathetic control of the pupillary size um, so, so as you know the parasympathetic stimulus causes the constriction of the meiosis of the pupil for, for this pathway for the meiosis to occur the light impulse travels via the optic nerve to the optic chiasma where there is a decussation of the nasal fibers. Then it travels by the optic tract and then to the pretectal nucleus. And from the pretectal nucleus, there is innovation to bilateral edinger westphal nucleus. So because of the, these two decussation, one occurring at the optic chiasma and the second occurring at the level of the edinger westphal nucleus, we can see that the optic, tra you know, both the, uh, opt the impulses via the optic nerve of one side is uh, uh, received by both the 
efferent pathway that is both the motor pathways the afferent pathway is the uh, sensory pathway and it is ends up to the petechial nucleus and from the edinger westphal nucleus starts the motor pathway so we see that the afferent pathway the afferent impulse or the sensory impulse is received by both the motor tracts that is why even if we shine a torch light into one pupil one eye both the pupils are constricting and this is because of the bilateral innervation of the edinger westphal nucleus from the petechial nucleus so this means that the sensory impulse is received by both the motor motor tracts so now we come to another parasympathetic impulse and this is the near point stimulus so for the near pathway we know that uh, when we look at the near target our pupils are constricting so we are trying to understand how this occurs although the exact pathway is not known it is a uh, uh, thought that the uh, impulses are travel uh, the impulses uh, go by this pathway so describing this pathway in brief the impulse from the light impulse from the retina goes to the optic nerve then it goes to the optic chiasma and optic tract and then it goes to the lateral geniculate body unlike in the um, light and direct uh, and consensual light reflex pathway where the fibers from the optic tract went to the uh, went to the petechial nucleus here for the near point stimulus the light pathway goes from the optic tract to the lateral geniculate body from the lateral geniculate body the fibers further pass to the optic radiation and the occipital cortex and from the occipital cortex through undefined pathways it travels to the frontal lobe from the frontal lobe and this is the afferent pathway from the frontal lobe via unknown pathway again the efferent or the motor pathway goes by the edinger westphal nucleus and travels the same path that is from the third nerve it goes to the ciliary ganglion and short ciliary nerve and innervates the sphincter pupillae to cause constriction of the pupil now we come to the sympathetic control of the pupillary size so the sympathetic control uh, as we know the dilator muscles they are under the sympathetic control and uh, in a, uh, and stimulation of the sympathetic pathway cause the pupils to dilate so we'll just shortly describe how this occurs so the center of the sympathetic control starts at the posterior hypothalamus and the first order neuron they traverse along the brain stem and the uh, and the Uh, and the cranial spinal cord and synapse at the C8 to T1 to 2 levels from this the second order neuron the uh, uh, synapse at the superior cervical ganglion and the fibers of from these traverse along the internal carotid artery and uh, ascend upwards towards the cavernous sinus and traverse by the short leaf uh, and traverse along the sixth cranial nerve for a short period of time then they go by the fifth cranial nerve and finally they traverse by the nasal ciliary uh, nerve and they just for a short course of time just uh, traverse along the ciliary ganglion unlike the parasympathetic pathway there is a no uh, uh, they just travel through and do not uh, uh, synapse at this level they do not uh, uh, and from the ciliary ganglion they pass along the long ciliary nerve and the long ciliary nerve innervates the dilator pupillary muscle to cause the pupil to dilate so we see that the sympathetic pathway it travels from the brain uh, from the posterior hypothalamus to the brain and it travels along the spinal cord it travels along the it travels along the neck it travels along the brachial plexus then it travels along the neck along the angle of the jaw and further it goes upwards to the cavernous sinus and then finally it goes via the nasal ciliary nerve from uh, and travels by the ciliary ganglion without synapsing and then it goes by the long ciliary nerve to the to the dilator pupillary muscle so it has a very long course and pathology along any of these areas may lead to the damage of the sympathetic control leading to meiosis uh, which is and the problem in this sympathetic control is known as the horner's syndrome which about which we'll be talking briefly later on so another important thing we have to understand while we under uh, while we talk about the anatomy is the pathway for the near reflex so the pathway of the near reflex is a little ventrally located uh, uh, com compared to the light reflex so this means that any lesion in the dorsal side will affect the pathway for the light reflex more and uh, that spares the near reflex 
because of which there are some conditions that occur uh, which causes the instances of light near dissociation of the pupil so it means that any lesion which are located more dorsally will affect the light reflex leaving the nearly reflex intact and these are some of the conditions which cause the light near dissociation we will be talking about that also later on so besides the direct pupillary reflex consensual pupillary reflex near reflex another important reflex is the swinging flashlight reflex so swinging flashlight reflex uh, 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 swinging flashlight test helps us to identify the relative afferent pupillary defect and there are some other uh, important reflexes just to mention a few there is a darkness reflex that means when there is dark condition when there is a dimly lit room then there is contraction of the dilated pupillary muscle leading to uh, the, um, leading to a state of mydriasis uh, the exact uh, center for this reflex is not known then there is a psychosensory reflex which is a cortical reflex in in which when there is a loud noise or pain there is pupillary dilatation another reflex is the lid closer reflex that is when we are blinking there is uh, when we are blinking or closing the eye the pupil becomes small or there is constriction of the pupil this is known as the lid closer reflex so after understanding about uh, the different things that we have to uh, un, uh, examine while examining the pupil we'll just go to this uh, a small uh, pro uh, protocol for examining the pupil so whenever we are examining the pupil we look for the size of the pupil we look at the shape of the pupil and we look whether the pupils are equal or not and that is pupil whether there is presence of anisocoria so after that after we examine the size the shape and the equality of the pupil we have to look, look at the response to the pupil when when uh, there is constriction uh, when we look at the direct response we look for the constriction when we present an ally, when we present a, tor a torchlight to the pupil then we observe for the consensual response so the consensual response means that when we are shining a torchlight in the right eye we look for the constriction of the pupil in the left eye so that is the consensual light reflex then we again repeat in the opposite eye if we have done the direct and consensual light reflex of the right eye then we do the direct and consensual reflex of the left eye then we check for the accommodation test so accommodation means when um, when the person objects a new near target there is constriction of the pupil so we look for the accommodation and finally we check for the swinging flashlight test for the rapd so these are the things that we have to observe so size of the pupil the shape of the pupil whether the pupil are equal or not then we look for the uh, light reaction so when we look for the right reaction another thing that we have to mention is whether the responses are brisk or whether they are sluggish whether there is a dilatation lag or whether there is a tonicity of the pupil tonicity means there is a sustained relaxation or dilatation leading uh, to a tonic pupil so size shape equality and the response to direct consensual or near reflex and swing flashlight test and also look for the other things like dilatation lag or presence of tonicity of the pupil so what are the things that will help us in examination of the pupil a bright source of light because whenever we examine the pupil if we are examining with a dim torchlight it will be difficult to evaluate the pupillary reaction so a bright source of light will help us to examine the pupil better so bright source means it can be by an indirect ophthalmoscope or simple bright flashlight will also do then to measure the size of the pupil a pocket gauge also a gauge also known as the pupil gauge also helps us a lot so a pupil gauge is nothing but a scale in which there are uh, sizes of the pupil drawn by black circles like shown in the uh, figure in the top uh, top right so when we uh, just ex uh, if, um, examine the pupil keeping the gauge near it we can roughly assess the size of the pupil by looking at the size of the circle and comparing it with the size of the pupil so another thing is a slit lamp slit lamp not only helps us to see the sh uh, size and shape of the pupil uh, sometimes when we are unable to um, a certain whether there is any reaction by a torchlight uh, 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 a subtle reaction can be assessed by the help of a slit lamp a neutron density filter is a very useful technique by which we can quantify the presence of RAPD or relative afferent pupillary defect.
So this neutral density filter is a filter which is mounted like a prism bar in a uh, small bar in which uh, the uh, filter is graded from 0 0.3 with incremental uh, values of 0 0.3 up to value of 0, 1, 1 log, mar, log, log unit, uh, uh, sorry, up to, with 10 filters which are placed with the incremental value of 0 0.3. So what we do is we put a neutral density filter in front of the unaffected eye and check for the RAPD until the RAPD disappears. And thus we can quantify the amount of RAPD that is present. So by quantifying, we can just help to, uh, it can help us to monitor the patient later on. And also it becomes an objective evaluation of the pupil. Uh, however, we are not using neutral density filter that regularly. Another method by which we can objectively quantify uh, the reaction of the pupil, uh, the size and the uh, uh, response of the pupil, the dilatation lag and uh, um, latency of the pupil reaction is by a pupilograph machine. So it is an infrared video camera which uses a computer software to analyze the pupil reaction. So these are some examples of pupillary devices. So the figure on the left side, the top left and the bottom left, show the handle pupillary devices. So now they not only measure the size of the pupil uh, under different um, light conditions, they also give us an idea about the reaction of the pupil, the latency of the pupil. And the other one in the right uh, right hand side, we can see a slit lamp mounted pupillography device, which gives us uh, uh, gives the same idea about uh, size and the reaction of the pupil. So when we examine the pupil, there are a few pre prerequisites that we have to consider uh, consider while examining a pupil. So the, ideally, uh, when we are doing an uh, evaluation of the room, the room should be dimly illum illuminated or almost a dark room to examine the direct consensual and the swinging flashlight test. Because if the room is already dark, the pupil will be, if the room is already very bright, the pupil will be myosed and then it will be difficult to evaluate for the light reaction. And in a dimly lit room, the pupils are usually large and the response to the bright light can be assessed better and more easily by using a dimly lit room. So always try to use a dimly lit room while doing pupillary examination or switch off the lights and just put a pull on the curtains before doing a pupillary light reaction. Then the second thing that we have to consider is that the patient should be asked to look at a distant target because if the patient keeps on looking at the torch or keeps on looking at you, uh, near reflexes are uh, working, that is accommodation is working because of which there is already myosis. And then as we have just discussed, a small pupil, it's very difficult to assess the pupillary light reaction in a small pupil and we might not get the um, exact um, examination value. And for, for near reflex, it is uh, good that the, the room should be uh, bright enough that the patient will be able to visualize the target because uh, they didn't do especially a pattern target and evaluation of a pattern in a target gives a better idea about the near reflex. So for uh, now we have to also see that the bright torchlight is used and the room is dimly illuminated and the patient is looking at a distant target while doing a pupillary light reaction to get a proper idea of the pupillary reactions. Now we'll briefly discuss about the abnormal pupillary reactions. So there are various types of abnormal pupillary reactions. So for ease, we can divide it into four categories. One is the afferent pupillary conduction defect. So as the name afferent suggests, it means that there is some problem in the sensory uh, sen sensory pathway. So for the eye, the sensory of the sensory pathway is carried out by the optic nerve. So any problem in the optic nerve will lead to afferent pupillary conduction defect. The second arm is the efferent pupillary defect. So the efferent pathway or the motor pathway is usually taken by the third cranial nerve. So any problem in the third cranial nerve will lead to a efferent pupillary defect. The third abnormal reaction is the pupillary light near dissociation. That means the pupil, light, uh, the pupil responds better to near reaction than to light reaction. And we'll just be discussing about the few factors, few of the diseases that lead to this uh, unusual phenomena of pupillary light near dissociation. And the last one is the anisocoria or difference in the size of the pupil. So talking about the first one, that is the afferent defects. So afferent pupillary defect can be total afferent pupillary defect and it can be a relative afferent pupillary defect. 
So a total afferent pupillary defect, as the name suggests, is caused by a complete optic nerve lesion. So it is also known as the amorotic pupil. And a relative afferent pupillary defect is caused by an incomplete optic nerve lesion, or sometimes even a severe retinal lesion or extensive amblyopia can also lead to a relative afferent pupillary defect. So there are, there is a, this is a list of the few of the causes that lead to a relative afferent pupillary defect. The most classical is the lesion of the optic nerve, like optic neuritis. Then there are ischemic diseases of the uh, optic nerve, like is ischemic optic neuropathy, or sometimes of ischemic lesions of the retina, even central retinal artery occlusion or extensive central retinal vein occlusion can also lead to RAPD. Advanced or end stage glaucoma can also lead to RAPD. And sometimes direct damage to the optic nerve by trauma, radiation, tumor, all of these also lead to ret RAPD. Uh, then retinal detachment, a very severe, large retinal detachment can also lead to RAPD. Similarly, a severe macular degeneration um, like can also lead to RAPD. And sometimes extensive infection or lesions of the retina, like in CMV or herpes, can also lead to RAPD. Similarly, as we just mentioned, uh, a very extensive amblyopia can also lead to RAPD. So let's just talk about a normal pupillary reflex. So in this diagram, it, uh, we can see that both the right and left optic nerves are normal. So when both the optic nerves are normal, when the light is shown on the um, right eye, we see that the right pupil is constricting. So at the same time, the left pupil is also constricting. So direct because of the consensual light reflex. Now, after, in the swinging flashlight test, after shining a torch into one a right eye for three to four seconds, the torch is briskly moved to the left eye. So on moving the torch to the left eye, then again, there is a constriction uh, of the left, uh, both the pupils, both the left and right pupil, assuming that both the pupils are normal. So in the swinging flash, flashlight test, what we do is we quickly shine the torchlight into one eye, and after putting it there in for three to four seconds, we swing the torchlight to the other eye for three to four seconds. Then we swing the torchlight back to the other eye for again three to four seconds. So we can continue to do this um, uh, for about three to four times uh, until we see a response. And sometimes we can do it fast and then again slow. And again, we can, uh, because of the bleaching phenomena, if we cannot uh, assess and we suspect that there should be an RAPD, we can repeat the test again after other test examination uh, for subtle kind of RAPD. So when there is a relative afferent pupillary defect, that means that uh, there should be some pathology in the optic nerve. So in, let's assume that the left optic nerve is normal, uh, is not normal. That is, there is some problem in the left optic nerve. So if the right optic nerve can perceive 100% of the light, here, because of some pathology and the damage of the axons of the left optic nerve, it can perceive only 50% of the of the illumination that is given. So even though we are shining a torchlight of 100% power, we can the left optic nerve will feel only 50% of the power. So we have shy, uh, shown a torchlight to the right eye. So when we shine the torchlight in the right eye, both the pupils have constricted. Now we have uh, uh, after three to four seconds, the torchlight is swung to the left eye. But because the left optic nerve can only feel 50% of the light, the consensual light reflex of 100% has decreased to 50%. So there is a paradoxical dilatation of the pupil. So when we swing the torchlight back to the right eye, again the 100% in impulse that is felt by the right optic nerve is again carried to the left optic nerve, leading to further constriction of the pupil. Now let's say that again the torchlight goes back to the left eye. Now the 100% of the impulse that was conveyed by the healthy right optic nerve is decreased, is gone. And now the impulse that is felt only by the damaged optic nerve, which is only 50% occurs because of which there is again dilatation of the pupil. So this is known as the paradoxical dilatation of the pupil, which is detected by the swinging flashlight test. And this occurs when there is a presence of relative apparent pupillary defect. So for a relative apparent pupillary defect to occur, there should be abnormality in one optic nerve. Sometimes if there is a symmetrical damage 
to both the optic nerves. That is, both the optic nerves are affected, but one optic nerve is affected more than the other, then also there can be presence of RAPD. So RAPD does not mean that there is always damage in one optic nerve. And also it does not mean that when there is no RAPD, there is no damage to the optic nerves, because sometimes if both the optic nerves are damaged to the same level, there can be no RAPD, but still, as we know, there, can, there is damage to the optic nerve. So in those cases, we'll have to use other, techno, other diagnostic techniques or other um, parameters of function of the optic nerve to diagnose this problem. So this is a short video just to demonstrate how a RAPD looks like. So when the torch light is shown to the right eye, it is dilating because the right optic nerve is dysfunctional. So I'll just repeat it once again. So we see that the right optic nerve is dilating, whereas the left is constricting because there is problem in the right optic nerve. The right optic nerve is only uh, feeling uh, uh, the, the impulse that is transmitted by the right optic nerve is less than that that is transmitted by the light optic, uh, left optic nerve because of which there is a paradoxical dilatation of the pupil. So RAPD. So, uh, so relative apparent pupil defect can also be graded by swinging flashlight test. So when there is a weak initial pupil reconstruction followed by greater redilatation, that is grade one. When there is an initial pupil stall followed by greater redilatation, that is grade two. When there is an immediate pupil redilatation, then it is known as grade three. When the immediate pupillary dilatation and then later there is pupillary constriction, there is grade four. And then when there is immediate pupillary constriction and there is no dilatation at all, that is grade five. So it can be also graded according to the use of neutral density filter. Now we come to the second one, that is the efferent pupillary defect. So efferent pupillary defect, as the name suggests, is occurs when there is a damage to the motor pathway. So when there is an effluent pupillary defect, there will be absence of both the direct and consensual light reflex on the affected eye. And there will be presence of both direct and consensual light reflex on the normal side. And apart from direct and consensual, the near reflex is also absent. In short, it means that the pupil, the affected pupil will remain dilated and fixed. So the common causes of the efferent pupillary defects are uh, when the patient is using some drugs like atropine and all the end motor end plates are saturated. So now there will be no reaction. So this is because of drugs. The second is because of there is an internal ophthalmoplegia. So internal ophthalmoplegia means the internal muscles of the eyeball. That is internal muscles are the dilator and the sphincter pupillae muscles. They are paralyzed because of any disease or because of any drugs. And the third cause is because of the third cranial nerve palsy, because as we know that the motor pathway of the um, uh, the efferent pathway or the motor pathway is uh, is travel uh, it goes by the third cranial nerve. Uh, any problem in the third cranial nerve will lead to the efferent pupillary defect. So the characteristic of the efferent pupillary defect will be a fixed and dilated pupil, in which there is no direct and consensual reflex in the and near reflex in the same eye while the while the other eye will be there will be presence of the direct uh, reflex will be there the consensual reflex of the uh, affected eye will also be present in the other eye now the third abnormality is the light near dissociation of the pupil so it's a situation in which the pupillary near reflex is present but the light reflex is absent so classically, it is seen in the Argyll Robertson pupil, uh, that is the tertiary neurosyphilis. And sometimes it can also be present in bilateral old retinal detachment or bilateral optic atrophy. It is seen in the dorsal lesions of the midbrain. It is also seen in long-standing diabetes or chronic alcoholism. And it is also seen in the adystonic pupil. So we'll be talking a few uh, of this, a few of the important uh, diseases later on. Now we'll move on to the fourth category of the abnormal pupils, pupillary reaction, and that is the anisocoria. So as we've just discussed, anisocoria is the abnormal, uh, is the difference in the size of the pupil between the two eyes. So why is it important? Because although a large number of cases of the anisocoria may be benign due to physiological anisocoria, 
some of the causes of anisocoria are able to uh, are also occurring because of a variety of life-threatening etiologies like presence of tumors or presence of aneurysms so if we are promptly able to diagnose these conditions we may be able to save the life of the patient that is why for every case of anisocoria a detailed history and careful physical examination will help to stratify the etiology and determine whether the patient will need further emergent imaging or urgent referral or we can just ask the patient for routine follow-up care so let's talk about the physiological anisocoria so as the name suggests physiological means that there is no abnormal pathology in the body and is occurring because of normal phenomena so it is occurring this physiological anisocoria occurs in around 20 percent of the population so the characteristic finding of physiological anisocoria is that the difference in the size of the two pupil is usually less than one millimeter in size. So if the difference in the size of the pupil is more than one, we have to suspect that there are other pathologies going on. But if there is difference is less than one, we can be we can just um, ensure that there is uh, there is it's just a physiological anisocoria and there are no further pathology underlying pathology in the body. Another characteristic of physiological anisocoria is that the pupillary constriction is normal to light uh, and uh, during uh, uh, light and dark, and it also is this, that is there is no difference in the size of the pupil in, during brightly lit condition and dimly lit condition, and it responds normally to near vision. And sometimes uh, it is it has been noticed that the anisocoria may switch sides. That means that. Sometimes it, on previous examination, let's say three months back, the patient came with a large pupil in the right eye. On this examination, the large pupil may be in the right, left eye. But uh, the important thing is that the pupils, the size uh, difference in the size of the pupil is always less than one millimeter in uh, one millimeter, and the response to both the, um, or to uh, light, uh, <clears throat> the response to light is normal and it's brisk and it responds normally to near vision and the pupillary and the side difference in size of the pupil in bright and dim condition is also equal now we talk about the pathological anisocoria a pathological anisocoria may be when the pupil is either abnormally constricted or abnormally dilated so when the pupil is abnormally constricted we have to think about a list of things for example the use of myotics uh, use of myotics is quite common in the glaucoma and long-standing use of phylocarpine, which the patient might not even tell you about, may be one of the causes leading to an abnormally constricted pupil. Another thing is any other drugs that the patient is taking, like uh, maybe for pain that is prescribed by the physician, or sometimes <clears throat> even recreational drugs, they might be leading to anisocoria. Then we have to look for inflammation in the anterior segment because of iritis, uh, Horner syndrome, Arjun Robertson pupil, or sometimes even long-standing Aries pupil, and brain uh, pontine hemorrhage due to brain injury. They all can cause to abnormally constricted pupil. Now, when the pupil is abnormally dilated, when the pupil is midriast, uh, when midriast, when the pupil becomes larger, we have to again think about use of drugs, use of midriatics, like whether the patient has been using uh, tropicamide for pain relief or even phenylephrine using Ocurist for uh, red eye on and off, uh, whether the, uh, or sometimes even accidentally, the patient might have taken atropine for some purpose. Then sometimes because of trauma, they can be damaged to the iris muscle. And the, sometimes aristonic pupil, a normal asymptomatic healthy female who comes with a, a large pupil, aristonic pupil can be as, uh, one of the causes. Uh, when the patient is coming with uh, a droop, uh, drooping of eyelid along with a uh, deviated eyeball, uh, we can think of third cranial nerve palsy when the uh, and pupil involvement such uh, is usually noted by the presence of a mid dilated and fixed pupil. When the patient is come, uh, coming with a painful red eye with hazy cornea and a fixed mid dilated pupil, acute congestive glaucoma should always be ruled out. So with all this um, background, with the exam, how a pupil looks like, how it should be examined, and what are the different abnormal pupils, now we'll uh, proceed to how to approach to a patient with abnormal pupils. So we always start with history. 
So anisocoria sometimes may be so subtle that the patient may not have not, uh, noticed it at all. And accidentally, there is uh, one of the friends may have noticed, or while uh, applying eye makeup, the patient may have noticed um, uh, noticed it suddenly. But because uh, it, it might be asymptomatic, uh, the exact time of the onset of the um, abnormal uh, abnormality in the pupil may not be known. For this very reason, old photographs can be of great help because sometimes the patient may be adamant and tell you that he just the anisocoria occurred yesterday because she noticed it while applying eye mascara uh, evaluation of old photographs may help us to see that it might be a case of Aries people which might have been there for more than 10 years so always don't always um, depend upon the history of the patient because uh, sometimes because uh, it might be asymptomatic the exact time of the onset may be missed and in that case old photographs will be a great help then uh, we have to see for whether there are any other signs uh, where the patient has any other symptoms along uh, associated with the anisocoria, pain in the eye, discomfort, redness, whether there are visual changes like in cases of iritis or angle closure glaucoma, whether there are other associated features like atrosis of the eye, elevation of the lower lid, whether the patient is having anhydrosis, which would tell us about the presence of Horner syndrome, whether there was any head injury, whether there was any ocular injury suggesting either traumatic mitriasis or pinpoint pupil in cases of pontine hemorrhage, whether the patient had ocular surgery or previous ocular eye disease because of which might have led to eye, uh, trauma in the iris leading to abnormal pupils. Uh, birth trauma is very important, one of the causes, important causes of congenital Horner syndrome whether the, the patient is using any recreational drug or even pharmacological drug, topical or even systemic for uh, depression or anxiety or any other antipsychotic drugs, which may alter the size of the people. We should also ask for any neurological symptoms like any focal weaknesses or neurological deficits that can be associated with the central nervous system lesions leading to anisocoria. And dysphagia, diplopia, ataxia, vertigo, paresthesia, some of the symptoms that we should ask about. Other thing that we should not miss is headache, history of weight loss, appetite loss, hoarseness of voice, all are symptoms of uh, uh, symptoms of neoplasia, underlying neoplasia like horn, uh, Horner syndrome. When the patient has history of syphilis, diabetes, or hypertension, we should, uh, and there's presence of a tonic pupil, we could think about the um, light neodiso and light neodissociation. We can think about these disease, underlying disease. Presence of eye pain, redness, and little blurred vision would, uh, uh, on examination, may lead to uh, finding of iritis when we see cells and flare in AC when there's eye pain, redness, blurred vision, and halos around light, and especially with a stony hard eyeball, we should rule out glaucoma. When the patient has got a normal uh, white eye with photophobia, and the patient is having difficulty in near focus, we can think about adystonic pupil. So now we go to the examination. So when we examine the uh, patient, always eye examination will start with visual acuity. And when we look at the pupils, as we just said, pupil examination should be examined in ambient room temperature, then in bright light and in dim light. And a PERLA is a very useful acronym to help us not to miss the important things. So PERLA will be uh, pupils which are equal, round, and reacting to the light and accommodation. And plus, as we said, we have to see the exact size of the pupil whether the response are brisk or not, whether there's presence of REPD. And another important thing, if there is abnormality in the pupil, is to look for the fellow travelers. That means along with the abnormality of the pupil, whether there are any other uh, associated abnormality, whether there is ptosis, whether there is presence of abnormal extraocular movement, which will help us to clinch the diagnosis. So then we shine, uh, shine a torchlight, a bright torchlight in each eye to determine whether the pupillary response is direct and consensual or normal. And then determine whether there is anisocoria. If there is anisocoria, whether the anisocoria is created in bright light or dark light. And then we look for the accommodation response and the RAPD. 
So along with that, we look for ptosis, whether there's presence of uh, mild ptosis or severe ptosis, whether there's presence of reverse ptosis, and if the, because if there are eyeball, um, if there is ptosis and the eyeball will look smaller than the other one, then it is known as apparent in ophthalmos and uh, mild ptosis, reverse ptosis and in ophthalmos is a feature of the Horner syndrome. Then look for extraocular movement. A mild uh, uh, partial ptosis with partial restriction of the extraocular movement along with the involvement of the pupil is a characteristic feature of the third cranial nerve palsy. Then further always we should examine the cornea, the anterior chamber and the iris. As we just said, a hazy cornea which is uh, uh, hazy cornea with a shallow anterior chamber with a stony hard eyeball which suggests exact diagnosis of angle closer glaucoma. Similarly, if there is history of trauma, multiple iris sphincter tear would diagnose, help us to diagnose a traumatic mitriasis. Then when we look at under the slit lamp, we should also, especially in a dilated pupil, we should also look for the movement of the, um, the movement of the iris in response to light. If there is a segmental paralysis of iris, which is typical of the adystonic pupil, there's a wriggling or undulating movement of the iris, which is also known as the vermiform movement of the iris. And this is one of the typical finding of the adystonic pupil. Then further, we look in the anterior chamber to look for signs of cells and flare in iritis, presence of holes and tears in the iris, and we should always measure the intraocular pressure. Then for the examination of the neurological status, the status of the cranial nerves, whether there is presence of any focal and sensory neural deficits, any cerebral lesion will um, help us to exactly uh, find the site of the lesion. Presence of the neck pru and mass, uh, neck pru and neck masses of Horner syndrome in cases of Horner syndrome is equally important. Then, depending upon the cause, investigations will be sent. A uh, thorough, uh, complete blood evaluation is uh, examination of the sugar for uh, diagnose long-standing diabetes. Uh, syphilis can be examined by PDRL or FDA absorption. Uh, any tumors or masses in the apex of the lung, which is one of the uh, one of the causes of the Horner syndrome, can be diagnosed by a chest X-ray. An MRI or CT scan, depending upon where we think the lesion is, can be done, depending upon uh, after the evaluation of the neurologist. And sometimes lymph node biopsy can also help us to diagnose metastatic lesions. So when we examine, we have to find out which one is the abnormal pupil. And that can be determined by examining whether the anisocoria is greater in dark or in bright light. So when the anisocoria is greater in bright light, it means that the larger pupil is abnormal because in response to a bright light, a pupil should be smaller. But if it's not able to constrict, it means that the pupil, uh, the larger pupil is abnormal. And when the anisocoria is greater in dark, it means that the smaller pupil is abnormal because normally uh, when it's dark, a pupil should be able to dilate. If it's not able to dilate, that means that the small pupil is abnormal. So we have to see first when we examine the pupil, we should rule out whether it is physiological anisocoria. If it's not physiological, find out whether it's a Horner syndrome, third nerve palsy, a traumatic pupil or a adystonic pupil. So briefly talking about what uh, some of the important causes that we should not miss while doing a pupillary examination is a Horner syndrome. So Horner syndrome is when there is a, a disruption in the sympathetic pathway. So uh, classically, a patient with Horner syndrome will have anisocoria, which is greater in dim light. Uh, there will be a, myos, a small myosed pupil, which reacts equally to light and near. There will be mild ptosis and inverse ptosis or reverse ptosis. And there will be apparent anophthalmus. And there is anhydrosis of the affected higher side of the face. Anhydrosis means there is absence of swe uh, sweating in that part of the face. And heterochromia of the affected iris is often present in cases of congenital Horner syndrome. So we can do a few tests to confirm whether it is a, a really Horner syndrome or not. So one is by identifying the dilatation lag. So in normal people, the dilatation lag is usually less than 10 seconds. But if it takes more than that to dilate it means that it is one of the uh, it is a cause case of Horner syndrome. Then a cocaine uh, can also be used if there is a dilatation in response to cocaine. 
so when we use a cocaine what happens is that it releases uh, the norepinephrine uh, it uh, uh, it blocks the reuptake of the norepinephrine from the synaptic cleft so a normal people will dilate more so leading to a more difference in uh, there will be more increase in the anisocoria by using a cocaine test and we can further differentiate the level of the lesion by using a hydroxyamphetamine test so hydroxyamphetamine test uh, will help to differentiate whether it's a preganglionic or the postganglionic Horner's syndrome so when we use hydroxyamphetamine if the anisocoria increases it is postganglionic and if the anisocoria decreases it means that it is a preganglionic lesion However, these drugs are not available with us and nowadays uh, if we see a case of Horner's syndrome, we directly go to imaging technique like MRI to uh, find the site of the lesion. The another important cause of anisocoria which should not be missed is a third cranial nerve palsy. So it is usually very, uh, not very difficult to identify because it is usually associated with the other uh, mm, uh, other features like ptosis and mm, uh, ptosis and involvement or, or restriction of the extraocular movement of all the other muscles supplied by the third cranial nerve. So the typical case would be a patient with ptosis and the eyeball which move, which is moving down and out because of the unopposed action of the lateral rectus and the superior oblique muscle and the pupillary involvement leading to uh, uh, third cranial nerve as we know supplies the parasympathetic pathway so because the pupil is not able to constrict the pupil becomes large and dilated so large and dilated pupil is typical uh, scenario for the third cranial nerve palsy and uh, pupillary involvement in case of third cranial nerve palsy is of um, great uh, uh, great value because it is an emergency condition uh, unlike um, cases of third cranial nerve palsy without pupillary involvement where we don't have to worry so much because it might mostly be a ischemic cause which is caused by either long-standing diabetes or hypertension uh, leading to ischemia of the third cranial nerve and it is not an emergency condition but pupillary involvement usually suggests that it is a compressive lesion most likely due to an aneurysm of the posterior communicating artery which might burst at any time leading to a brain hemorrhage and even impending death that is why any patient with third cranial nerve palsy with pupillary involvement is an emergency condition so in this photograph, you can see that the uh, patient has got a totic eyelid, which is just elevated by use of an earbud. And the eyeball in the right eye is de uh, laterally deviated and slightly downwards deviated. And we can see that the pupil is dilated. So this is a uh, third nerve palsy with pupillary involvement. And the photograph below on the uh, on the left side shows an aneurysm of the posterior communicating artery and the c shows a diagrammatic figure in which the uh, arrow shows the superficial arrangement of the pupillar motor fibers in the third cranial nerve palsy and any aneurysm or any mass uh, would first affect these pupillar motor fibers leading to uh, ischemia sorry leading to involvement of the pupils whereas an ischemic lesion would not affect these fibers so much so ischemic lesions like let's say because of diabetes or hypertension would not affect these fibers so the pupils would remain intact even if there was presence of complete third nerve palsy that is why pupil involvement in a case of third nerve palsy requires immediate uh, neurological uh, evaluation and intervention then traumatic pupil so a patient with a trauma a following trauma can have either a big pupil or a large, small pupil so there's presence of sphincter pupillae usually the pupils are large and it's quite easy to diagnose you know, under a slit lamp when we wear we can see multiple notches at the site of pupillary sphincter rupture sometimes without any sphincter rupture also the pupils may be large and this is because of the shock uh, to the uh, sphincter or pupillary muscle or um, because of which the pupil becomes dilated sometimes following trauma the pupils may become small and this is usually because of the intense inflammation in the anterior chamber leading to a lot of uh, inflammatory mediators release leading to a small pupil if there is trauma leading to a open globe injury there might be presence of iris prolapse and the iris may be peaked and pulled towards the side of the prolapse and sometimes even during a blunt trauma there might be iris disinsertion from its root that is iridodialysis 
leading to a pupil flatter in the corresponding area of the dialysis. So let's briefly talk about the adystonic pupil. So the adystonic pupil is usually an idiopathic condition and usually unilateral. So it is caused by the denervation of the post ganglionic supply of the sphincter pupillae and the ciliary muscles, and the pupil is usually dilated. And because of their segmental paralysis of the, um, uh, of the uh, nerve supply, there is a vermiform movement of the iris. Another uh, the important feature is the light near dissociation. So the light reaction is not present, uh, is very sluggish, almost absent. But when the uh, patient looks at a near target, there is near reaction is present. And when the patient again looks back to the distant target, there is a tonic redilatation of the pupil. So from because of this tonic reaction of the pupil, it gets its name Addy's tonic pupil. So the characteristic feature is there is a unilateral, usually unilateral, meat dilated pupil, which reacts poorly to the light, but there is a brisk reaction, uh, but there's a better reaction to the near light, and there is a tonic redilatation of the pupil. So, um, um, the, uh, we can I diagnose uh, Addy's pupil by using uh, topical 0.1% pilocarpine, because uh, there is a hypersensitivity of the pu of the um, hypersensitivity to pilocarpine, only Addis pupil will constrict in response to 0.1% pilocarpine. But if there is no uh, reaction to 0.1% pilocarpine, we can administer 1% pilocarpine. If one it responds to 1% pilocarpine, we should think about third cranial nerve palsy. But if it is, does not even respond to 1% uh, pilocarpine, when, then we should think about pharmacological mitriasis. Now, this is a flow chart which will help us to diagnose what is the cause of the uh, anisocoria. So if the patient presents with anisocoria, then we look at the light reaction. If the light reaction is brisk, then we have to think, uh, we have to look for dilatation lag. If the di there is no dilatation lag, that is it reacts briskly and, uh, and uh, quite easily, then it means it's a physiological anisocoria and no further re workup is required. But if there is a brisk reaction, light reaction, but dilatation lag is present, then we should think about Horner's syndrome and work up accordingly. But if the light reaction is also sluggish, then we have to look at the near deep reflex. The near reflex uh, is, um, if the near reflex is good, but the light reaction is sluggish, then we think about the causes that lead to light near dissociation. We look for adystonic pupil, look for the tonicity, we look for the Argyll Robertson pupil and see if there are the neurological association. And we look for the dorsal midbrain syndrome and look whether there is up case is good or not. But if both the light reaction is sluggish and the near reflex is also sluggish. Then we do a pilocarpine 0.1 percent pilocarpine test. If it responds to this very low level of pilocarpine, then we should think about adystonic pupil. But if the, the pilocarpine 0.1 percent test is also very sluggish, then we should think about whether it's a rule out whether it's a case of angle closure glaucoma. If the pressure is more than 40 millimeter, then we should we can think about angle closure glaucoma and treat accordingly. But if it does not respond to that, then we can add 1% pilocarpine. If it is responding to 1% pilocarpine, it is constricting, then it is a third cranial nerve palsy. But if it does not respond to 1% pilocarpine, then we can think about pharmacological uh, mitriasis. So with this flowchart, well, I'll end my topic here. And if there are any questions, uh, you are free to ask. Thank you for the session, ma'am. This was very informative for all of us, especially for first and second years. Here we have one question in chat box. It is by Bipin Dai. Uh, his query is, uh, ma'am, is there any term like inverse agral Robertson pupil? I have not heard about inverse, uh, but there is a term known as pseudo argyll Robertson pupil is there. So uh, uh, normal argyll Robertson pupil is uh, classically described in, uh, in tertiary neurosyphilis. 
So what happens in tertiary neurosyphilis is get that because of the syphilis, uh, the underlying exact uh, etiology is still not known, but probably because of some problem in the midbrain, as we said that the dorsal fibers, uh, the uh, pupillary fibers are more dorsally located than the near reflex fibers. There is light near dissociation. So a classic Argel-Robertson pupil will be uh, bilateral small meiotic pupils. And on further examination, there might be other features of syphilis, like they might be anterior chamber reaction, they might be uh, some choroidal lesions or retinal lesions. Uh, apart from that, they might be other places, other features of their tapes dorsalis. So this is a typical Argel Robertson pupil. But we know that not only syphilis leads to um, light near dissociation. So there are other fire causes like adiastonic pupil or sometimes even chronic alcoholism, uh, peri uh, peripheral neuropathy because of even long-standing diabetes can lead to these conditions. So these conditions, other than um, syphilis, uh, tertiary syphilis, which cause light nerve dissociation are known as pseudo argel robertson pupil. Uh, anything else? Yeah, Sanjita Di, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Nira. On the behalf of the student, I just want to query from the student. Okay, so yeah. you thought no palsy, efferent pathway defect, back of uh, um, uh, condition. So, I'm the suspect or as someone, they say we won't see any changes in that RAPD. You know, RAPD is in the people. Our in case, let's say our orbital lesions are one, it can be in orbital lesion, both the afferent and efferent pathway can be gone. But if there is only lesion of the efferent pathway. The limit dilated, fixed mid dilated pupil, they will not be in RAPD. So it is not necessary that a fixed mid dilated pupil will not have RAPD. This collagency, we should always do a singing flashlight test to find out the lesion. But strictly speaking, efferent pathway defect by one is a fixed dilated pupil unuporeo, afferent pathway defect by one is a RAPD unuporeo. But it is not necessary that only one will be affected. You know? Sometimes both the third and second cranial nerve may be affected. So there can be presence of both also. So if it ain't a pathway defect one, it's a suspect or as a fixed mid dilated pupils have any any swing flash light test got it already RAPD is evaluates and go on a person. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Ma'am, we have one question from Galaxy. The question is how to distinguish either sensory or motor pupillary defect? Uh, we've already discussed that. In you know, sensory bone, there should be a lesion in the optic nerve. So that can be determined by seeing a swinging flashlight test. You know? Besides that, we can also use a pupillography. Main bone, because a pupillary reaction is not So that will give us an idea about the afferent or the sensory component. A motor defect, you know, like it's a pupillary fibers or like I'm going to get up on the air. Not for you. So when we go to the flow chart, yeah, let's go to the flow chart. Eh? Nice. So looking at this pathway, so up to the pretectal nucleus is the afferent pathway defect. No? Once it goes to the edding of well, from here it comes the efferent pathway defect. Afferent pathway defect pupils or So either there is an RAPD or if both the optic nerves are involved, the impulse of the pupillary stimulation will be less. You know, if both the optic nerves are involved, what happens? There will not be an RAPD, but the reaction will not be as brisk as the other one. But if there is an efferent pathway defect, it is only affect it does it affects only one of the optic nerve. They were efferent If there is a problem in the efferent or third cranial nerve palsy, boy, when it's the pupil ma near reflex uh direct pani udaina, consensual pani udaina to akama. The orkohama subbigura normal. Okay, so we have to see whether it is affecting only one eye, and when we see we have to see for both all the three direct consensual and near reflex if all those three are absent that means it's a efferent defect efferent pathway problem but if there is a presence of an rapd that means that there is an afferent pathway defect i hope this clears your question
संसदी और कोई उड़ा है वन नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन दैट आई हैव गोट इज किरे यू थर्ड नो पालसी हुँदा खेरि चाहिँ पीपल इन्वोल्वमेन्ट हुने र पीपल इन्वोल्वमेन्ट नहुने कन्डिसन एक्चुअली फेरि एक्सप्लेन गर्दिनु भनेर भन्दै छु सो अब पीपल इफ पाथवे फाइबर्स इज मा टु आई जस्ट गो टु दैट स्लाइड Uh, so in this uh, slide you know we can see that this is a third cranial nerve and in the third cranial nerve you know at the center ma there is always vessels which supply the uh, whole of the uh, nerve this is known as the vasa nervorum so any problem in the ischemic lesion let's say the patient is uh, has got atherosclerosis and the vessels are becoming smaller and smaller so that means there is ischemia it will not be able to supply this third ocular motor nerve so the problem will start mainly at the center of the nerve and because the pupillo motor fibers are located more peripherally in this case the they uh, um, and because these are uh, pupillo motor fibers as are uh, located peripherally they will also get some of the nerve supply from the sur surrounding uh, csf matter to the arachnoid process and the csf le pani supply gariraheko huncha yesma ani arko vasa bahiro ko vessels haru pani auncha ani supply garcha tei bhara chai yo peripheral located fibers are not affected much in vascular lesions of the optic nerve so vascular one ko ischemic lesions but if there is any compressive lesion let's say there is an aneurysm which is present in the peripheral part or if there is a tumor which is located just as adjacent to the optic nerve so what will be compressed for first the central fibers or the peripheral fibers so obviously the peripheral fibers will be affected first so that means the pupillo motor fibers will be affected rather early in cases of the compressive lesions so if there is pupillary involvement you know the dictum is that for any if there is a pupillary involvement then we should always think of a surgical cause or a compressive lesion so compressive lesion could be a tumor it could be a aneurysm so both of these constitute an ocular emergency but if there is no pupillary involvement you know it does not mean that no compressive lesion will uh, have a, all compressive lesion have, will have pupillary involvement bhaneko you know? haina but in majority say if there is pupillary involvement we should always think of a compressive lesions and these compressive lesions you know because of its location usually they are in close proximity to the um, circle of villis the blood vessels of the brain so it means that it could be an aneurysm or it could be a tumor in the brain and all of these are uh, can be uh, fatal and it can be life threatening so these conditions one ko ocular emergency ho and an urgent mr angiography or ct angiography che should be done to identify the lesion but if there is only third cranial nerve palsy without pupillary involvement then the chances that it is a compressive lesion is very low less than 10% so in those cases you know we can just wait our complete third nerve palsy so without pupillary involvement bunny we don't have to worry so much but if there is a partial third nerve palsy with uh, without pupillary involvement it means that still there might be you know absano ab apno aneurysm ho bani che there might be chances of the aneurysm to become larger and compress more and there might be a chance that the Now, pupil involvement may occur further. They, but these two cases are much partial third nerve palsy. Much how many? Pani, I'mly. After ten, twelve, ten, twenty, twenty. Kurera, we have to repeat um, examination of these patients. But if there is a complete third nerve palsy without any pupillary involvement, then we don't have to worry further. And we just can think that it is a ischemic process, and we can wait for it to resolve on itself after a while. So that is why our patient like to neuro imaging, gorni ki no gorni, you know, MRI, gorni ki no gorni, bani rite. Pupil erno, so ekdam zori cha third nerve palsy ma. Is it clear? Yeah, yeah, the yeah, I hope that is clear. Thank you so much. Welcome. Any other questions? I hope China will be. Thank you, this first uh, wonderful session. I hope it was a dam, a dam, मतलब effective for all the students as well as I was uh, throughout the PPT. It was very wonderful time. The thank you so much. You're most welcome. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, bye bye. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you.